Hello, I hope people can hear us. Let me get one more thing added. Uh, as a source, and maybe my phone, but I'm not able to hear. Hmm, what else did I mute in here? Super faded, Andrew, thank you. <clears throat> oh, now it's audible. Okay, yeah, we were muted for a second while I was getting stuff situated. Uh, we also want screen capture. Oops, oopsie is sorry, Adrian. <laughs> I'm so bad at this. Okay, I just need to get a window capture, right? <laughs> Um, yay, welcome, we're so excited. Okay, let me get this. Too late. <laughs> okay, here we go. This looks good. Video quality. Is it? It looks good on mine. Um, okay, maybe it just took a sec to... Uh, so starting with introductions, probably. Uh, Adrian, do you want to start? Wait, hold on, Adrian. Is anyone able to hear Adrian? Windseeker108 says they can only hear me. Where? Where is it, Sam? In the stream room. I'll edit you window in the mixer. Background. Screen capture zoom. It says, yeah, it's not it's not working for some reason. Audio input capture. Uh, okay, say your words again. Desktop. I do not under mixer. I have my mic aux, which I guess is mine. And then I have screen capture zoom, but nothing is coming out of it. But it is on all the way. I, I hadn't anticipated this being in try sources. Okay. Audio output capture. Uh, 
please just start. Okay, try speaking again, Sam. It's, I don't think it's working. No dice. Thank you, Windseeker. So I have, for, do I need to like turn mine off maybe? Mixer settings. Oh, I see. Yeah. Monitor and output. Okay, can you try again, Sam? Um. I don't know how to fix this. Um, I could turn off my AirPods. Oh, let me see. Speaker. Zoom apps. It has something to do with Zoom and the program. Yes, Zoom and Streamlabs. Okay, I put it as default. Sam, do you wanna try speaking again? Yeah, thank you, Lane. Hang on. Okay, um, so I switched from my AirPods. We still can't hear Sam. Okay. Okay. You can hear Adrian. So really cool. <laughs> Just like you're <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I can't get it right. I need to stop looking at. Okay. Wait, can they hear you now? Because I turned off my AirPods and now it's my mic is going when you're speaking. My mic okay. is going when you're speaking. All right, cool. Okay. Yes, it's working now. Okay. Oh, this okay. Just been cool. Yeehaw. Okay. Awesome. We did it. Okay, so we're gonna have to mute when each other is speaking. Everyone, whoever is like. Thank you for being so patient with us. What do you mean? We're gonna have to mute, right? Just, it's gonna pick up any background noise. Like if you're not speaking, mute. Okay, go again, Adrian. Please introduce yourself. Thank you to our viewers. <laughs> okay. Thank you <laughs> Asia with us. Okay, so I'm Adrian Lamb, and I'm an assistant professor at Binghamton University um, here in Binghamton, New York. I am a paleontologist. I work with microfossils, so mainly planktic foraminifera. So these, this is what I was trying to show you before and talk about. This is a 3D printout of one, Trilobata seculifer, um, but in reality, they're about the size of a grain of sand. So we get those from the bottom of the seafloor. I sail on um, scientific ocean drilling expeditions for two months at a time to retrieve sediments from the seafloor and study these fossil plankton. But I'm also an invertebrate paleontologist. I work with brachiopods, trilobites, modeling their dispersal and evolution through time. So I'm also co-president and co-founder, along with Jen Bauer, of Time Scavengers. Um, so thanks for being here for our first uh, Twitch experience. I guess I'll go next. I'm Jen Bauer. Uh, I currently work at the University of Michigan as a collection manager where I kind of take care of, uh, conserve, manage the three million or so fossil specimens, uh, mostly invertebrates and microfossils. 
uh, some trace fossils and other things as well. Um, you kind of can think of me as a librarian of, of fossil life. Uh, people check stuff out, come to visit me, um, do some research and outreach. Um, and along with Adrian, I also co-founded Time Scavengers. Popcorn to Sam. Hi, all. I'm Sam. I use they, them pronouns. Ignore the they, she, and my Zoom username. Um, I am an incoming PhD student at West Virginia University. I'll be starting my PhD in the fall in the Lambsdale Lab. Um, I work on horseshoe crabs. I think they're really neat. I'm really interested in their evolutionary dynamics and um, their ontogeny. Um, and I'm just here because they're my friends. <laughs> and they let me tag along. <laughs> Yay, so we have, a, I guess, Adrian's uh, slide up, if you wanted to start. Sure, okay, so this is a fossil specimen, let me grab it, that I've had for a couple years now, and I bought it from a show, so I did not get this myself, I wish I had, and I use it a lot in outreach. I'm not a big fan of, like, promoting that you should go buy vertebrate fossils. Um, however, I knew the guy uh, who bought, who, Got this one from, I think, a creek or a river in Florida. So anyway, um, the fossil that I'm talking about today, the species I'm talking about today are the mammoths. So it's been pretty cold up here in the Northeast. We got snow the other day, so it's put me into a, like a Ice Age Pleistocene state of mind. Um, so this is a mammoth tooth. So I'm holding it upside down, but this is how it would sit in the mammoth's mouth. I'm going to back up to get the whole thing in here. So we've got the top of the tooth is here. So this is like the grinding surface. I'll get a little closer of the mammoth. So where it would chew the grasses that it would eat. And then this part of the tooth, this is the root. So this sits in the animal's mouth. So mammoths, of course, were very, they're proboscians. They're related to elephants today. Um, and they evolved in the plio, plio, Pliocene. So probably about 2 million years ago or so, um, or some of their earlier relatives. And the last living representatives of mammoths actually went extinct. It was like four, four thousand years ago. It was right around the time the Great Periods pyramids were built. So mammoths didn't go extinct that long ago. They overlapped with Homo sapiens, with humans, modern humans. Um, just a really neat fossil. And because this fossil is pretty young, this is all original material. So it's still a fossil, but this is like the original enamel that was in the animal's mouth. You can see some of the bone or the structure, the tooth is broken off here, um, but it's also quite heavy because it's filled with sediment from when it was in that river and just got filled with a bunch of stuff. Um, so that's my fossil today that I'm sharing and um, talking about a little bit. So if y'all have any questions, let me know, but I'll have it here with me. Um, but it's quite a big, big fossil. So it's bigger than my hand and I've got small hands. So maybe that's not saying too much. Um, so yeah. I'll pass it off to Jen or Sam. Uh, I was just gonna comment, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, I, I know we just talked about mammoths and I'm from Florida, so like I grew up with a lot of mammoths, but I also grew up with a lot of forams, which is what Adrian specializes in. And I just wanna say that like, since we're talking about favorite fossils, I just wanna say that like one of my favorite fossils is Lepidocyclina, which is like a large benthic forum. And it looks kind of like a potato chip with a bulge in the middle. and when I, so I grew up as a dinosaur kid and I always wanted to work on dinosaurs. Like I came in as a freshman to UF being like, oh, I'm going to study dinosaur feathers. Like that was my whole thing. And then I was actually converted to the invertebrate side by Lepidocyclina because I thought it was so cool that you could like, it was finally something that was very tangible. And it's like my favorite party trick now, even to like go look for rocks anywhere here in Florida. I'm back home in Gainesville before I start my PhD. Um, and you can basically find forums like everywhere littering the floor or just look for like the potato ship shape and be like, look, Pringle, ancient. This is a single cell, which often um, interests a lot of people, too, is like telling them it's a single cell because it's crazy because most people don't think of single cells as being quarter sized. So anyways, I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, and to add on that, so you just mentioned like forums, right? And they're large. They're single cell, but they can get pretty big. And I just mentioned the pyramids. So speaking of both those things, some of the largest foraminifera are the Numilites, and the ancient Egyptians um, use them for coins. So they're about like they can get like pretty big. Um, I don't think I have any like right here at my desk with me. Um, I can run over and go grab one for my collection. So, but the Great Pyramids are also full of Numilites of these benthic foraminifera. 
So it's kind of a very cool connection between like Fendic Formanifera and Mammoth that I didn't really expect us to make, but that's pretty fun. Um, Jen, not to pressure you, but do you think you could find a picture of like one of the bricks in the pyramid with Pneumolites showing? Because that's like one of my favorite visuals. That's like what's really cool about being a geologist and paleontologist in general is like you're always able to just, you know, like you can go anywhere and you can kind of start to think about like how we all fit into the bigger picture, not to get philosophical so early on. <laughs> Yeah. Stream. but it's Welcome. so cool to think about you know like it's oh, yes yeah, whoever whoever's talking about eating forams i probably have inhaled a stupid amount of forams because i've picked forams before um and i'm i'm almost certain my lungs are full of forams which is like fine yeah here are some uh, good potato chippy ones These... oh, did you find some good images yeah yeah so crunchy <laughs> so crunchy <laughs> ocean pringles <laughs> yeah they're really beautiful Creatures. I used to, this is really dork. I don't know why I have to preface this by saying I'm really dorky. I mean, I'm here, but um, I I remember when I, I had just gotten into embroidery when I had like started working on forums and I actually um, went through and like embroidered pneumolites because I just loved it so much. Um, and that's, I'm like a spider, which makes it like appropriate that I work from coliserates, but I love needlework. And so I love to incorporate um, fossils into my projects. And so I, I remember embroidering pneumolites was like one of my first ever embroidery projects. And I don't think I have it. Well, actually it might be behind me somewhere in the chaos, but anyway, sorry for derailing us on the 4am train. <laughs> I definitely forgive you. <laughs> yeah. I was holding you to the 4am train, yeah. leaving the station. All aboard. <laughs> Um, um, but when I was holding up a second ago, these are Demulites, and my camera's not focusing, it's so annoying. But they're small, but they're they're also not little. the biggest Demulites that you can see. So they're Eocene in age, so they're about, I don't know, 40 million or so around there, um, give or take. But yeah, these are just tiny little babies, they can get much bigger than that. So just tiny little representatives. I, I'm so sorry. I'm, now I've like fully derailed on the 4M train because I'm like, ah, yes, I have so many thoughts now. <laughs> I um, I think it's Astrocyclina that's star shaped, and I'm obsessed with it. And um, I actually got really lucky. Um, and this is I'm just gonna be fully transparent. I like there was an artist that reached out to me that I had followed for years, like before, like when I was still like a paleo fan instead of like actually pursuing it as a career, like. This was probably like I'd followed him since I was maybe in middle school to early high school. And he reached out to me one day and he asked if I want to do an art collaboration. And I lost my absolute mind because I was like, it felt like I had made it because it was suddenly like, oh, my God, this big artist like knows who I am. I'm no one. Um, but I when he asked me what I wanted him to draw, I did. Astro Cyclina, I think, because I was just like, it's star shaped. It's so beautiful. And it I love forums because they're like sculptural almost. Because I, I don't know how I become like an art nerd because I'm really like not good at art. <laughs> but I just, I mean, I find so much beauty in like the natural shapes of things. Okay, so the slide I was just holding up. So I just did in my paleobiology class, my lab was protists. So I have all these foraminifera like on hand. And um, Baculogypsia spiraculata is the species you're talking about, the star shapes. I can't, it's not like showing up really great. Again, my camera's not focusing and then they fall. They're not like glued on the slide. But you can kind of see how big these things are if I like jiggle them around. Well, not really. Okay, but they're about the size like, of a very large grain of sand. But you can definitely see like the star shape when I'm looking like right down at the slide. It's very, very cool. They're so cute. So we have a they're question, awesome. Adrian um, or Sam. What causes the star shape in that species? Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about uh, how foraminifera grow? Sure. I'm not sure what causes specifically the star shape in these species. So the main test is that's what we call the shell for foraminifera is composed of like calcium carbonate. Um, and then the star shapes come off where you have these little pinches off of that shell or that test. I'm really, I actually, I honestly don't know what the star shapes do. Um, the morphology or the shape of the species test is very unique and interesting. Um, they, it may have something to do with them living in more shallow water environments. These benthic foraminifera can live in like reefal systems or like more beach or estuary habitats, and they are typically a little larger. But the planktic foraminifera, the ones that I work with, 
Um, they live in the open ocean, so open marine. They're not near shore. You don't typically find them in more of like a shallow water reef environment. Um, and their shapes in the planktic foraminifera really depend on if they're living in the very warm mixed layer of the surface ocean or if they're like living along the thermocline. So in general, planktic foraminifera will have that live in the very warm surface layer. So about like right at sea level or, you know, down to about 50 to 100 meters, they'll have little holes in their tests and they'll have spines. And they have these photosymbionts that live on their spines that are actually photosynthesizers. So that forium has to live in the surface ocean for those um, photosynthesizers to photosynthesize. So they can't really live in deep waters. Therefore, their tests have to be very light. However, the species of planktic foraminifera that live along the thermocline, so the deeper region of the surface ocean where we're trying to kind of transitioning from like really warm surface waters to really deep, more denser waters, their tests are more heavily calcified. They're thicker. They have this feature on the outside of some of these species, what we call a keel. It's like this thick, like little ridge that goes around. And their tests don't have as many holes in them because they have to be pretty robust to keep them, you know, at a certain point in the water column. So perhaps these benthic foraminifera that have these star shapes, you know, in their morphology, their shape probably has something to do with the environment they're living in. Cool. Thank you. I was trying to, to Google through some forum shapes while you were talking. Um, Sorry. I was like deep in investigating. I found the art and I sent it to you on Discord. Um, but um, what was I going to say? I fully, oh, I was just going to say this is mildly relevant in that it's also a micro fossil, but I have this video of a coccolithophore like secreting coccoliths and it's really cool and I'm obsessed with it because um, I'm one of the cursed people who actually like cell biology, which like should say a lot about what kind of person I am. Um, but I do have like a really neat video and I'm trying to find it right now. Like I'm like aggressively typing a coccolithophore video. <laughs> I also have my drawing tablet like up, so I might share sketching since I all of my fossils are in storage right now because I'm like transitioning between my master's and my PhD. Um, so I can't have I don't have any to show you, but boy, can I talk about them? <laughs> Maybe draw them really poorly. Um, but that's the fun, right? Um, so we should revisit Adrian's actual fossil for a second because I did yes. pull up a 3D model of uh, mammoth jaw. Let's see if you can kind of see it. You being the viewers at large. It's pretty cool. I don't, I guess Sam and Adrian, you guys have a viewer up so you can see what I'm showing. Okay. I'm staring. <laughs> I'm perceiving. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and then maybe we should also show a different, um, show a mastodon so if you're okay talking about the differences in teeth really quick yeah i think that's a great i was gonna say if we pull up a mastodon because i don't think a lot of folks sometimes recognize the difference between the two and it's all due to like their tooth morphology those tooth shapes that was like my favorite thing to do when i worked in the florida museum was be like look at their teeth <laughs> walk from this <laughs> room into that room <laughs> well because everyone would either there were like two usual responses because it's the yeah. It is the mammoth when you walk in, if I remember correctly. Yeah, the mastodon's in the back corner. Um, but everyone would point and just go dinosaur. And I was like, oh, it's my time to shine and be really annoying about this. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So there's the mastodon that Jen has on the screen right now is sharing. And this is a mammoth tooth. So notice that the mammoth tooth is very smooth and flat. Oh, that's cool. It's not my ring over it. Um, but... The mastodon tooth has like more bumps on it. So that's the difference between mastodons and mammoths, not the only difference, but that's the main difference how we can tell their skeletons apart is by their teeth. So mastodon, mastodon is actually translates to nipple tooth, which is, you know, a man named it great, um, but that's okay. Uh, but essentially that's the shape of their tooth and that's what they thought or named them. And their teeth are shaped like that because they're specifically made for grinding. So you can actually get like, they were chewing on like twigs or branches or stuff like that. Um, it's more useful for that. Whereas these flat teeth are more for grinding down grasses and vegetation that's a lot softer. So if you can imagine taking something that's flat and trying to grind like a woody stick or something with it, it's not going to happen very well. 
But if you have teeth with those sharper, more defined ridges on them, they're really designed for grinding some of those harder, woodier substances, not like those, you know, softer substances like grasses, like the mammoth ate. Yeah, and someone asked if mammoths actually only have four teeth. Um, I think they've got two and two. Is that right? I think they've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in total. Um, but yeah, they don't have many teeth because their teeth are like quite large. So you can imagine. And if you notice, like their jaws are kind of short compared for how big the animal is. So you really don't can't pack a whole lot of teeth in that jaw. So they have to. Yeah, they have just a few. It looks like Jen's having a convo about collections. Yeah, sorry. You, <laughs> no, I was gonna say you want to share it. Like, like oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So part of my <laughs> part of my job is to facilitate uh, donations of material. So um, usually it's from like local collectors who have really uh, big collections that relate to the mission of our our museum. So. Um, they sign some paperwork transferring the title of, of the objects to, to the university. Um, and usually it's not a ton of material. It depends on the, the collector, of course. Uh, but we're also facilitating like a transfer of specimens, which will also undergo that shift in, in ownership to the University of Michigan. Um, so the Michigan State University is kind of downgrading their teaching collection because their invertebrate paleontologist is leaving. So there won't be anyone to to curate the material. So she wanted to make sure that it, it was taken care of. So the answer is yes, but it all depends on like where you are, where you want the material to go, but we, we don't want orphan collections. So that's a big thing that the National Science Foundation and other large funding granting institutions are, are concerned about because information will get lost very quickly. Oh, yeah. I tried to get Jen to transfer me her entire Formanifera collection when she started at Michigan. <laughs> They're all mine like, now. No. Yeah, that's like not how it works. <laughs> I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> She's like, I'm going to take your fossils. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I'll give you some bracket pods and echinoderms in exchange. <laughs> like, this seems fair to me. <laughs> no, because I do not own the specimens, right? It's the institution. Yeah, the should, bubble wrap. But we can come up with like a conversion rate for fossils, <laughs> for right? Forums. Like how many vacuum <laughs> pods are equal to how many forum slides? Right. Like, it's uh, like, oh, well, you can just save space and these are much cooler, right? You love echinoderms. <laughs> Not that much. <laughs> You're like throwing them at her. Take them. <laughs> like, take them. Take them. <laughs> I'll bring up some brachiopods pods for people who, who, Brax. who aren't as familiar I was just talking about Brax with you guys too because I was telling I was talking about how exciting they are to me because where I, I grew up in Florida so everything here is super young and boring to me because it's what I'm used to I'm like super jaded about mammals don't get me started on mammals <laughs> but um, I always get really excited about brachiopods because I didn't grow up seeing them and I feel the opposite way about bivalves because I saw them so my, my lab next and I feel like is... whatever your um Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, whatever fossil you grow up seeing constantly, you become like, I feel like everyone like kind of is bored. Like shark <laughs> teeth and mammals. <laughs> so my lab next week is brachiopods. So I have a ton of brachiopods behind me. Oh, that's so exciting. Here's Rincanella moravica. It's from the Upper Jurassic. It is from Syria. But so this is from our collection here at Binghamton. It's not an official museum collection. I hope to make it one one day. Um, but there was two paleontologists here decades ago. So I'm actually the first paleontologist to work in my department in over 25 years. So there's a lot of old, very cool things here that I have to like hunt down and look for. And it's been such an adventure. Um, so I have these wonderful brachiopods from all over the world that I did not collect. Um, they were collected by Dr. Van Riper in 1962. I don't know who that is, but these were collected like decades ago that we have. So they're very cool specimens. Oh, yeah. I just saw the story about like taking fossils. Like I remember when we went to we went to Hale Quarry um, with the paleo class one time at UF and our um, invert collections manager took a um, 
crab fossil from someone and that student yelled, that old man took my crab at the professor teaching the class. Um, so yes, that does very much happen. I totally <laughs> forgot about that. <laughs> Roger, <laughs> Roger's so funny too. That man took my crab. <laughs> he was scurrying away with the crab. <laughs> Good for him. I would do the same. Oh, that's so funny. Um, should we return back to our favorite fossils? Sure. <laughs> Circle back to, we've talked about foramps, proboscideans. Um, so I didn't finish my slide, but it's on a trace fossil called Ophiomorpha. And I also have an example. It's one of my favorite fossils. You can kind of see there's like lumpies on the outside. So that is from the animal that made the burrow, probably a crustacean, so a shrimpy, a shrimpy friend who like pushed poo pellets or other kind of balls up into the wall of the, the burrow. So it creates like a very interesting object. And this is like, mine has like shell hash in it. So it's probably from like a near shore environment that had a bunch of shellies that the infilled the burrow after the shrimpy had evacuated. Can you bring it closer? Um, I'm afraid it would be out of focus. Oh. Can you see oh, it cool. still? Yeah. Oh, that is a nice one. Yeah, it's super nice. It's one of my favorites because it's like a weird thing. And it was on, you know why I probably think it's my favorite? Because it was on my prelim exams. <laughs> Colin would do like a box of fossils and you'd have to identify every fossil in the box. And that was like he called it the box of pain and that was like part of your rite of passage was you had to identify all the different groups of echinoderms and this was my weird one and I I was thinking only of echinoderms so I was like I don't know what that is and he's like well what do you think it is and I'm like well it looks like a burrow and he's like it is a burrow and I'm like well why is it in the box <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was getting quizzed on echinoderms but Ophio, the ophiroids are an echinoderm, so I think he was like playing a joke. But I'm just thinking of like the Charlie from It's Always Sunny, like wild card, like very much. Yeah, that's exactly that. it. <laughs> that was his choice right there. Um, Poo pellets. Yes, they can be called yes. pelloids. I think they have quite a few different names, but yeah, I that's... really like trace fossils in general. I actually brought a couple more. They're um, so examples. underrated. They're really underrated. Yeah. This is a a snail that has been bored by, mm. I'm assuming, sponge. So all those holes is from, are from a sponge. And the holes don't go all the way through the shell, do they? Some of them do. But some of them are just that first layer of shell material. Yeah, so the boring sponges are probably, so they're only using that shell as like an anchor point, right? It's They're using it as like their home, kind of yeah. to kind of I don't think they're eating thing. it. No, but then there's also like boring gastropods and maybe they were, I don't know, maybe you have like two different types of boring oh, that would cool. on there. That's cool. Yeah, it's possible. And then I also have my other- Borings are anything but boring. <laughs> <laughs> Borings are anything but boring. I, I also oh. brought- um a shell with a coral encrusting on it. So it's some sort of like a uh, big oyster or like a scallop shell with a scleractinian coral on it. Cause I think these like biotic interactions are so cool. That's neat. Is that something that you found? Was it like a Florida specimen? Um, no, I don't think I found any of these. These I, um, when we were down sampling our collection at Tennessee, it was people take mm. stuff or we throw it out. So oh, dang. I took some stuff. I would take so many things. Yeah, I had like like a fair at my house where people could come because I just took everything to my house because I was going to make fossil kits, which I did do, but not everything you could turn into fossil kits. So I would have people come and bring their kids and I just had boxes of fossils that they could take. Is that like when you left Ohio when you moved out? You brought me, like, boxes of fossils. That was your leftover, right? In no, because this was in Tennessee yeah, you did no, that. Yeah, I did this. Okay, in, okay. It was in Tennessee. <gasps> That's right. Judy, are you kidding me? My Judy? <laughs> oh, hi! 
Awesome! I cannot believe it. Hi, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> we need like a Judy pop up. <laughs> we press a button. That up on <laughs> so wow! Easy. Just when I was talking about Tennessee, too, came out of the woodworks. <laughs> you summoned That's perfect. perfect. I summoned her. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I don't think we have any trace fossils up on you more. Oh, I can only. There's like a horseshoe crab more at Kenea that I think is oh, really neat, but Catra. I don't want to. Oh like... my gosh! So Cat was one of my students at UMass. Oh. <laughs> I was like, We're like trying to find out what, who everyone is. <laughs> I was like, UMass, what do you have a student? Now we're like, we know all of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lane is my undergrad who's like now a big bad, I think, junior. Oh my god. So excellent round fellow asks, how does one make their own fossil kit at home? I have a little cousin who would probably enjoy one. So it, this is like, you could do it in many ways. You could go and collect material. You could talk with like a local museum or, or um, display museum that has extra like, they call them consumable fossils that they like give out at events. Um, I'd probably try to join a local fossil club and see if they can um, help you with some, get some fossils. I'm going to turn my camera off for a sec. Okay, well, he's going for it. <laughs> <Can you? laughs> yeah, <Jess. laughs> um, yeah, so well, at Tennessee, we're really we used the full, yeah, the full <laughs> Bauer Brown experience. Uh, we had, um, like, you know, the bead boxes you could get at, like, a craft store. That's what we used to make the fossil kits. Um, you could also use like shadow boxes or Adrian and I found, what were those boxes? They had like a nice glass cover um, when we were at Ohio and we like stained them. Oh, I forgot about they those. They just had like little, um, yeah. little yeah. boxes, just anything that has like compartments for you to have like little spaces I think would be fine. Yeah, um, I would feel like Michael's. Maybe you said that. I was like Googling. Yeah, I think I said like a craft store, but local fossil clubs will help you. Um, get material or if you just email them they'll probably send you some stuff some do like they'll send sediment bags to different schools so that kids can practice picking through sediment to find fossils so um, just ask around and if you need some help shoot us a, a message on social media or email and we'll help you yeah and Kat had a good suggestion in the chat use clear tackle boxes that's mm -hmm. also really good is often they have those little dividers you can move around as well. And they're already in like a thing. One of the, oh, I was just gonna say, one of the other things you could do that's not necessarily a fossil kit is some people literally just sell dirt with like my, with like fossils in it. And that's always like a fun activity is to like pick through the dirt with, especially with a kid. But honestly, as an adult, I love mind numbing activities. So I was like, yes, this is my replacement for art coding during the pandemic because I didn't have any current project. That's amazing. Yeah, sorry. Now this is reminding me. I think Sarah and I maybe put pictures in the publication about our fossil kits. We had a Darwin Day um, publication. Here it is. I'm so distracted by the trilobite paper. I'm like, mm. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah, here it is. We made it kind of like, I have to fix my... This thing is like cropped weird. Oh wait, I have another really cool trial wave if anyone's interested in seeing one. I have to get it back to PRI soon so I can grab it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is, we, we thought it would be cute to make like a candy box almost of fossils. So these were the fossils that we had in our um, fossil kit and the dry dredgers um, helped us kind of get to the point where we had enough stuff to put in them. I think they gave us a bunch of casts of trilobites that they had painted so they looked really nice there is something that makes like I always think that having physical fossils or at least like I even if I can't bring in fossils I'll bring in like my I have like a bunch of stuffed extinct animals um like having that tactile experience to me always makes teaching about fossils so much more like real because like that's something that I always think about when I think about like outreach is like, how can I make this feel real? So we're not just like staring at like what seems like a rock to someone and being like, this was an animal once, just believe me, you know, I always like to make it so much more tactile. So when I used to do, sorry, I'm fully derailing, but we're talking about outreach, which is like my jam. Um, but I used to do this thing when I would. 
and volunteer at the Florida Museum where I would pretend I was in a time machine and I would find clips from like walking with dinosaurs or walking with monsters. I would typically avoid dinosaurs because I'm a pain in the butt and refuse to talk about dinosaurs because everyone talks about dinosaurs. Um, but I would bring in all my stuffed animals and we pretend to go to the Cambrian and then I'd like, look out the window, what do we see? And we talk about like Anomalocaris and then I'd hand out my stuffed Anomalocaris and it was like the best and I would make everyone make time machine noises. It was, man, you guys are making me miss outreach. <laughs> my favorite fossil is outreach. <laughs> yeah, that's a true so. It's like so fun and fulfilling. <laughs> There's nothing, nothing better than outreach. Isn't that what we're doing now? I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, we're just there. Did you, what did you like, go pick up, Adrian? Sorry, if we were fully on the What were you saying? What, what did you pick up? You, you went to grab oh, something. Okay, so there's a trial bike from the Paleontological Research Institute that we had on loan. Is it focusing? Mm-mm. A little oh, bit. my gosh. You can see that it's something. Yeah. <laughs> Really? Dang on it. Come on, camera. Be better. Anyway, this is Elrathi King Eye. It's one of their specimens that we had at uh, Binghamton. We've had it probably for 20 to 30 years. Um, it, yeah, they just emailed me the other day. And they're like, can you send this back? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, we can. But it's really great because it's like, you know, it's in this shale rock. It's just a very thin specimen. It's great to like showcase to people. But we had it like behind glass so people couldn't touch it. It was protected, but it's really cool because you can see the head, the cephalon. You can see the thorax, the middle segments, and then its little butt, its pagidium, is missing. So this was probably a trilobite that molted, um, and this part of the molt is, like, missing. So not a specimen that was alive and then died. Trilobites molt throughout their lifetime. That's how they grow. Um, but you can kind of see that broken off bit is part of the middle, the thorax, and then the butt is missing. But I just thought it was, like, a really neat specimen. They're so cute. Trilobites are the best, too. They really are. They're so cute. I remember finding my first trilobite and just absolutely going insane. Yeah. We used to find, like, well, like, like as oh soon God, as real. Jen and I, like, uh, used to go fossil collecting. Know. Oh, sorry, Sam. I keep cutting you off. I'm sorry. My internet connection is, like, awful, so it's going to happen. Sorry. Yeah, like... I think Jen and I, when we used to go to like the ordivision deposits around Cincinnati, we would find the little trilobite butts, the pagidiums, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. It like made my day every time I found one, which was often because there's a lot there. So. That's like what inspired my username, Trilobum. I used, I, I was like, tri- Trilobut is a little too explicit, so I toned it down with Trilobum. But, um, I love I love the word pygidium in general. It's like one of those like really good paleo words that feels nice to say. Eurypterid yes. is another one. Eurypterid is a good one. I'm just staring out in the trilobite eyes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh no, this is excellent for me. Yeah, I was trying to keep up with what Adrian was saying, but then like I got distracted. Like while <laughs> you were talking about the pieces of the trilobite, I was trying to bring it up. Oh, sorry. I was probably talking way too fast. Yeah, there's a pretty good one. This one has a butt. <laughs> or there might not even be shell material here. Oh, there's a little. Tune into the Time Scavenger that. stream for us to rate trial. <laughs> That's what we should do. That's oh, our next butt. topic. We <laughs> rate trial It's like we rate dogs. Yeah, exactly. like- <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, I like that. Rate, tra- rate like nice. rating fossils. That would be funny. <laughs> I have opinions, too. <laughs> that I do would as be well. Really so I was just going to hop over to another good resource, the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life. They have a super, super awesome, like, interactive textbook. Um, so you can go to Arthropoda, which maybe doesn't exist yet. Did I skip it? Yeah, maybe they don't have it yet. It's a big one, so I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't have it yet. But they do have a full uh, virtual teaching collection on here. Oh, James has entered the chat. What's up, James? Are we sure that's James? Or is that a James different fossil detective? Are you sure it's James? <laughs> what? Especially with the coming in with the trilobite. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know. I was like, oh, yeah, I don't know who this is. <laughs> okay, there. Yeah, it's me. Okay, cool. We did talk about crustaceans already. You must have missed it. Yeah. Oh, Christy. oh, yeah. We talked about old man stole my crab. No, and my burrow. Oh, yeah. Shrimpy. Shrimpy. Yeah, like a fossil tier list, even a tier list of museum displays. So that'd be a good one, too. Oh, that- 
that would be so or any museum that has like a virtual tour we could just like walk mm. through together yeah there was um there was like a pokemon digital tour like a museum in japan like did a pokemon exhibit like a fossil pokemon exhibit that you could walk through and i was losing my mind over it wait is that still up where is I don't know. It's I I have to go like search through my history to go find it, but I hope it's still up because it was really cute. That sounds like it. Sounds like, like something I totally do. My favorite, like to connect with the youngins. I always like to bring up Anorith because I'm always going to talk about Anomalocaris and no one can stop me. Um, is to pull up Anorith and be like, "What is this?" And kids will know what Anorith is, and I'm like, "Did you know it's real?" <laughs> and they're like, oh, God, no. <laughs> they're like, "We do now." <laughs> That's amazing. I'm going to see if I can find it now. Time to derail myself. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't taken my Adderall yet today, so this is like a, the best we can like expect from me. <laughs> Incredible. Um, okay, what other fossils can we talk about? What else do I have on my desk? Yeah. Showed you, oh, wait. Have I showed everyone wait. everything on my desk? Well, why don't we ask the... We have 10 viewers. Yeah. yeah. What, are, what are your favorite fossils? What are fossils? your favorite fossils? <laughs> coming for your kneecaps <laughs> goodness real well so judy likes gonioceros let me see if we can find some cephalopods here oh yeah let me see i don't know if we've got any if i've scanned any of ours yet Sorry, I'm like searching for the virtual exhibit. Oh, Cat still has crinoids. Wait, I have a cool crinoid specimen. Oh, crinoids. Yes. I love crinoids. Those are pretty. Let's see. I've definitely got a good 3D model of one of those from one of our fossil collectors. Wait, one of our. I didn't know that before. Our mineralogy professor just gave me this the last week. So it's a kind of concretion looking thing and it's crinoid stem impressions, but all of the crinoid stems have been dissolved out. So you can like see through it. So cool. That was where like a big crinoid stem was. And those are the big impressions. So these were like honking crinoids. I don't know the age. I'm assuming, well, it's, it's gotta be Devonian. They're found around here. But this, it's just like really neat. Yeah, those are big. Let me see. I've got a like a full slab almost with a stem cup. Let's see. Dee, dee, dee. It's a pretty good one. It's Magistocrinus. It's got the little tendrils. Have we have you pulled up a picture of like a crinoid raft because those are crazy i love thinking about them a crinoid Wait, what? when i was in the museum in germany there was like oh. a no joke like one whole wall was a crinoid slab like it was like a 50 foot crinoid slab i have to find a picture of it because i was like was jurassic probably yeah yeah and i was making like probably inhuman noises they also had it was a great museum i could <laughs> i love talking about museums. <laughs> yeah. yeah something that um adrian your fossil reminded me of uh, something that happens a lot with crinoid stems is, are log jams. So I pulled up a log jam here on the viewer. Essentially, it's like a bunch of crinoid stems that get washed together in some sort of cool. underwater event, and they end up being oriented in the direction of water flow. So Absolutely. all of these crinoid stems are current aligned, which is super duper cool. Yeah, because then they become environmental indicators of which way water was flowing. Yeah, so, and so, cool. yeah, it's cool. Oh, and there's a pretty cute one, too, with a calyx on it. Oh, and there's some arms, too. This is even cooler than I thought. <laughs> I love doing um, crinoid columnals as decorations on posters because they're just little stars a lot of times, and they're, like, the cutest little, like, we'll probably make them out of polymer clay and make little earrings anyway. <laughs> More art. Fossil art. Jen, don't you have a Dunkleosteus? Oh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Can you pull that up? I am. 
Here we go. Duck Chomp Chomp. is one of our games as well. Look at that baby. Yeah, this one's actually a replica from the Cleveland um, Museum because I think the original is there because it's a commonly found in the Cleveland Shale. So is that the holotype or is it just, is it not? Uh, let me see. Is it say on here? It doesn't say, but it is a cast. Very that is so amazing. Yeah, I love their uh, like lower tooth jaw thing. I don't know what it's called, but it's essentially like scissors, yeah. like the way it's like sharpened, like the edge of the of scissors. Let me see. Mm -hmm. I've always thought of it as like the guillotine animal, yeah. like it's like killing French royalty. <laughs> <laughs> 400 Thanks million years from, ago. Like, yeah, good Thank for Dunkley Yes, we, we stand an anti-monarch. <laughs> <laughs> it is like one of the coolest armored fishes. No, it is the coolest armored fish ever. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, mm, that's... that's pretty cool. I like the, I think armored eyeballs are cool. Oh, yeah. And it shows up a lot, like in a lot of different animal groups. I don't know. Like sclerotic any... rings? Yeah, I don't know. Like it shows up in ichthyosaurs, right? Yeah. Uh, and it shows so. up in pterosaurs. I'm trying to find. And it shows up in fish. Like what? <laughs> like did it come up multiple times, just once? Probably. Yeah. I'm trying to find. I have a picture of me screaming at Dunkleosteus that I recreated. This is the armored eyeball. I did I Animal Crossing. I can... That's currently what I'm like aggressively searching for. Armored eyeballs. Awesome. Yeah, and like, why? Why was the eyeball armored? Like, what evolutionary innovation drove that? That's so wild. Like, let me just evolve some yeah, armored eyeballs. I'm like trying to. Yeah. Think. I better be careful with like opening up images on Google. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just over here. We have the worst day of our lives simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No more live streaming. Yeah. <laughs> We're done forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Many eyes of many animal groups. That is so wild. What are those? Are those modern birds or fossils on your screen that you're sharing? Um, I don't think they're. Well, I don't know. Those are, yeah, like a modern bird. And then I see one is a hadrosaur. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm like, I can't see because it's just like tiny. Oh, sorry. Oops. No, you're fine. I'm like really into this now. I know. <laughs> I like this one. This one's really cool looking. Whoa. Oh, that's wild. We're all just staring at like Wikipedia photos. I know. <laughs> Being like, oh, wow. It's from a natural history museum. Let's see. So there's the... uh, that person always posts really great um this person. Photos. Like I, I know that I know their username. I'm fond like, of. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't we be able to click and see what they put up? I, I know they go to like a lot of European natural history museums because Karlsruhe is in Germany. I'm pretty sure because that's a German word. Um, There's a way to see their Wikimedia page, but I can't remember what it is. We're just we'll, like we'll do it later. That promoting this person. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they, they have posted good horseshoe crabs before. I know that. that's why I'm like, ah, oh, yes, um, horseshoe crab. We also had some ankylosaur talk and giant ground yes. sloths. I think. Florida had a really nice giant ground sloth in their museum. There's probably, I probably have like a billion pictures on my phone of different people with that <laughs> ground sloth. Where was that one, the recent ankylosaur that, what was it called? Like, it has like, um. Oh, it's just the B, the one that's like really cool. Oriel Kelta, is it? Yeah. Um, where is it? What museum? Canada? <laughs> yeah, here you go. Like I said, I try not to think about dinosaurs except for like modern birds. I like birds. Yeah, I do. I do like ankylosaurs. This one is just so pretty. I haven't yeah, seen it. Yeah, it's person. amazing. It's so pretty. It doesn't even look real. I know. It looks fake. It looks like dinosaur. Yeah. Like, Forgery. Yeah. Yeah. 
Forgery. Yeah, exactly. Like Jurassic Park type. <laughs> really, though? Amazing. It's so beautiful. Like, I love looking into its eyes and just thinking, like, you know, hmm, you're looking into the eyes of, like, this creature. Uh, it makes it so real. Like, what was it like? What did it think about? What did it eat? Yeah, it just... Do you ever just think about like sitting in a clearing and like the like the Cretaceous, for example, and just like watching dinosaurs pass you by, like literally all the time? I don't know. I was thinking about like a like a foggy morning. Yeah, <laughs> like, this is really dorky. But, like, no, I was thinking like, about that hiking here in New York. We're in the Devonian. I'm just like, oh my gosh, to be like underwater in a Devonian sea would have been wildly cool. That's like oh, growing up with like a lot of the documentaries, like. um it was one of Nigel Marvin's. There's one where he like scuba dives with like an orthoceros. And I would like, I always watch it and I'm like, hmm, wish this were me. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, um, oh Jen's there's a the... video game called Abzu where there's like a prehistoric room and you can mm -hmm. just meditate there. And it's just like has Dunkley Osseus swimming around you. And it's like one of my favorite. It's Wait, not like it's like anachronistic, like it's random prehistoric animals from like different time periods. Like there's Duncan also in Alacaris and like a bunch of like plesiosaurs. Yeah. But it's so nice to like they, they have meditation spots where you can just sit and like watch things swim by. And it's gorgeous. And it is it's like real. James. It's <laughs> um, pretty good. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. There's another but so it's so, it's so soothing that. and I always like it's one of my favorite places to just sit. That's so, so cool. So there's this episode of Love, Death, and Robots on Netflix. I'm really into the series. So it's like, whoa. Fish Night. <laughs> it's Fish Night. It's my favorite. I'll watch it all the time when the Dudley Osseus comes out. So oh, it's so listening, you have to go watch this right now if you have Netflix. Yeah, it's so it's good. So the series itself is like, you have some like real great ones and some real <laughs> like, what is this? But yeah. um, it's just so beautifully animated. Paleo media is so <laughs> yeah it's that's just, like definitely like we can make definitely several streams out of paleo media like god we could <laughs> oh, we should, totally do, that. We so should do fish night as our first one we could just like oh, that would be so fun and it's short right like that's the best part about them is it's cool exactly i mean paleo media was pretty formative i literally have a jurassic park tattoo so <laughs> i can't say anything <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Oh, amazing though. Um, I'm just looking at Jen's like University of Michigan diorama. Oh, oh Zima Blue is another really good one. I love that episode too. Oh, Zima Blue is so good. Um, well, oh yeah, Prehistoric Kingdom. Sorry, not to derail Jen. It's Back okay. to diorama. I was just gonna say we're almost at our hour. I think we only plan to do an hour stream. I'm really impressed with once we got things rolling. It seemed to, to work well. Um, I'll figure out that Zoom thing, I guess, for the next time. But if anyone wants to propose a topic for a future fossil gossip, please do in the chat. Or if you have any questions for us or suggestions, since this was our first stream, I think we're pretty open for feedback. Or email us, yes. Yeah. Oh, and we probably should have said that we're doing a fundraiser. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we're trying to raise money awesome. for the Tilly Edinger travel grant. So look on our social media and help us spread the word. Um, this helps offset cost uh, of attending meetings. I'll copy the link address to the donation page. Oh, thank you. No, I didn't grab that. Yeah. But there's Tilly Edinger. Yeah, if you can grab yeah. it. Pick your poison. Pick yeah. your page. So any any little bit helps. Um, and if even if you can't donate, sharing is really helpful as well with people people who uh, may be able to donate um, financially. Uh, I think that is how we were so successful in the past. Is just people shared our our content a lot, and we got quite a bit of donations. I think we funded like seventeen people so far. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe we'll do a, a whole stream just dedicated to talking about conferences and conference travel. Oh, yeah. Share some horror stories. 
Yeah. Oh, there are many of horror <laughs> stories. Yeah. Um, Go on all day about that one. Mm-hmm. Agree. Yeah, Agree. maybe that's a good topic for the future to, to fundraise specifically. I like that. Uh, thank you, Lane, for your help. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you to everyone who attended and <laughs> <laughs> tolerated our mess in the beginning of Hey, we figured it out, although I don't think it's a good, it's not like the best solution. There has to be a way to go from Zoom to Streamlabs. We'll figure it out. We will. Thank y'all for attending. Yeah, we thank appreciate you. it. Um, and do follow us. We, it looks like we got a couple followers, which is awesome. Hopefully we'll try to do this semi-regularly. We'd like to try to do some more fundraisers and just fun chit-chats. Okay, well, I'm going to end the stream now. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I, don't have, like, a, I don't have a sign-off or anything. I guess we'll have to come up with some clever, like, I don't know, fossil nerd type sign-off. Or a jingle. Yeah, catch you on the outcrop. Fossils <laughs> are cool. See you under the sea. <laughs> rocket blasting off again. <laughs> Close the stream. <laughs> Good night. Bye. <laughs> okay, thank you all.